Grace and peace in our Lord Jesus Christ. So we've all heard that uh, our former president, Jimmy Carter, has uh, gone into hospice as he continues his journey home. And that's brought out some thoughts in me, and, and, and maybe you too, um, as mixed as his uh, record might be as a president and we all remember his last days with the Iran hostage crisis were very difficult days for him and for our country. Uh, but I'm remembering Jimmy Carter as one of the most extraordinary ex-presidents uh, we've ever had, who used his, his power and his, um, his recognition and so on in ways that have helped humanity uh, and I remember being at the Carter Center in Atlanta um, as I recorded a uh, sermon for the Protestant Hour on the radio and um, got to meet people at the Carter Center and how he and the center participated in elections in many countries helping democracy to flourish. And of course, Habitat for Humanity will always be associated with uh, Jimmy Carter. And I had the opportunity to actually uh, be in the same room with Jimmy Carter um, in New York. Uh, they were launching the 100,000th, I think, or some milestone uh, build of Habitat for Humanity. It was going to be in Harlem. And Jimmy Carter met with religious leaders at uh, Cardinal O'Connor's place. And uh, it was wonderful being in the room with him. And he talked about Habitat Humanity, and at one point he said something like this. You know, people think it's about the building, the house, but it's not really, not initially. We live in a, a time and in a country where a person of privilege and a person in poverty don't ever have to be in the same room with each other, the same conversation. We can lead parallel lives and never touch each other. But to build a house, it's about that. It's about connecting people together in the same conversation and ultimately the same hope for ourselves and our country and our world. That, that really struck me. When I introduced myself to him later, he, he uh, became what he still is, an old-fashioned Baptist. Uh, he talked about... Uh, having had the local Lutheran pastor, and he gave his name in his Sunday school. And he talked about the Lutheran bishop, who was Julian Gordy at the time. He knew him. And uh, he was a pastor. Um, I, I'm not a pastor, but he was a lay leader uh, who, was, who, was, uh, who teaches Sunday school. A lot of people think that that is an anachronism now, that this, that old-time religion is is fading away um, that we're in a secular time now a post-christian time um, and uh, I don't think that's true Russ Douthat a columnist for the New York Times had a column this past uh, Sunday in, which began like this in an 1882-22 letter to the physician Benjamin Waterhouse, Thomas Jefferson expressed his confidence that traditional Christianity in the young, young United States was giving way to a more enlightened faith. Much like Jefferson's own in his rejection of the divinity of Jesus Christ. I trust he wrote that there is not a young man now living in the US who will not die a Unitarian. And of course, in upstate New York, at the same time, Charles Finney was having a revival, which became the second great awakening of faith in the United States. Faith just in coming out, um, no matter what. And I thought about what just happened at Asbury College in, um, uh, in, in Kentucky, a, a fundamentalist Methodist institution, uh, we talked about this in Bible class on Sunday, where there was a revival that broke out. Students uh, 
in spontaneous prayer, witness, testimony, scripture, singing. And people got wind of this and they got on buses and they took planes and they, 50,000 people came and showed up where this faith was breaking out. Just when you think that the Christian movement might have seen better days or that it's a relic of the past, these things happen. It's as old as Paul trying to terminate those young followers of the risen Christ who hit the road to Damascus and his life was completely changed. In the gospel for today, uh, for this coming Sunday, uh, John Schumacher will be preaching uh, at uh, St. Luke's in Park Ridge, and I'll be preaching in uh, Chicago, St. Luke. Uh, we'll hear the story of Nicodemus, which contains John 3, 16. Now, uh, your vision of John 3, 16 uh, might be uh, the guy in a rainbow-colored wig sitting between the uprights at a football game holding a sign painted with the world's most famous verse, For God so loved the world. But when I think of John 3, 16, I think of how much this is about God and we can't do anything about it, um, like it or not. God simply says, God so loved the world, period. You can like it or not. I almost think that when we have the scandal of baptizing babies, infants, who have nothing to say about it, we just go ahead and do it. We should almost say, um, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are now a beloved child of God, whether you like it or not. Because really, God's love for the world is implacable. God's love for the world is not about us. We can't cause it. We can't make it go away. God loves us we have to deal with it. God simply loves us enough to die for us. And that is why the faith can't be squelched. That is why Thomas Jefferson could look at the signs of the times and great awakenings break out all around him. That's why in our time, there's always this reaction somewhere of people who just say thank you, who hunger for that love of God, for that grace that is undeserved. For God so loved the world, Jesus said to Nicodemus, whether you understand it or not, whether you like it or not, God simply loves us. We can't do anything about it. We can't change it. We can accept it or run away from it. But God so loved the world. And every once in a while there's a great awakening, or even more gently awakenings, as our own hearts or our own congregations lean towards that grace.